Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth Wellness Summit session. Coronaphobia, virus anxieties, and getting help. My name is Gloria Fine. I am your moderator for this session. I'm thrilled to be here. Last year was my first year as a volunteer on the Wellness Summit Committee. This year I've graduated to being a Jewish Family Services board member on the committee. I care deeply about our community, which includes community mental health. I'm excited that we have been able to go virtual and open the summit to an even broader community, including people who are joining us from downstate Delaware and outside of Delaware. Please feel free to ask questions during this session. Click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen during the session. I will ask David and Paul your questions as they are ready to answer them. If we cannot get to all of the questions, we will be posting answers after the session. Today, we are joined by the father-son team, Dr. David Sheslow and Paul Sheslow. David joins us from the Hocassin Center for Change, where he specializes in anxiety and family conflict. Prior to this, he worked at AI DuPont Hospital for more than 30 years, serving as staff psychologist, co-director of the Division of Behavioral Health and director of the residency program. He holds an MA and a PhD from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Paul is a psychiatric nurse practitioner at Jewish Family Services of Delaware, where he provides outpatient medication management and psychoeducational services to clients ages Five and up. He is an outstanding diagnostician and works collabor collaboratively with his clients to develop trusting therapeutic relationships. He earned his master's degree in nursing from the University of Delaware. Please welcome David and Paul Sheslow. Thank you Thanks, so much. Uh, let's see. Screen share. So the goals, the goals of uh, today's uh, time that we have with you is to talk a little bit about the effects of the COVID-19 virus on, on our lives from a psychological perspective, a biological perspective, and even a pharmacological perspective. If I had to think about one word that, that uh, probably I hear more than any about what's happening during our times, it probably would be stress. So stress can be helpful and not so helpful. When we think about stress, we think about it as an inverted U-shaped curve, uh, where if you don't have any stress at all, you're probably sitting by a pool, sipping by a pina colada, and you're not really doing anything productive. As your stress levels go up, it reaches a peak at the top of the U where you're most productive, most interested in doing a good job. And um, you're feeling that this is the place where I, I'm really getting things done. As that stress level falls over the other side of the U, productivity begins to suffer and uh, and ultimately the stress level begins to fold in on your productivity. Yeah, and we know that um, stress can cause a lot of mental health problems. It can also cause a lot of physical problems. Um, you can see the list here that we thought were kind of the most pertinent to share. Um, and I think the big takeaway right now is that everybody just seems so stressed out with COVID and the social distancing and things like that, that uh, it's almost like a given now. Like, are you stressed out? Like, of course, you know, and I think in my own practice, the two questions that 
nobody uh, nobody wants to answer is what's new and are you stressed out? Because the answer is always yes. Um, you know, and I, I was seeing a, a kid who I said, what's new? And he said, you're not, you're not asking people that question, are you? Because the answer is nothing, you know? And I was like, oh, huh. You know, and he was a pretty smart kid. So, you know, I think, you know, the main topic of this, uh, uh, this summit and kind of what we want to also hammer home is what, what can you do about this? So before we talk about other kinds of mental health interventions, I, th I thought it would be it would be good just to talk about increasing our awareness, to reflect about what's happening with us during this time, and to spend some time honestly evaluating our inner lives. So if you're thinking about relationships, what were relationships like before the time of the virus? Were they fractured? Were they good? Did they suffer any change uh, in, in a direction that you really didn't want them to go during the virus? Are you preparing for a time when the virus is no longer going to be there with us so that you'll have something worth taking with you from this difficult time? But you look, at, look at your values, <coughs> excuse me, tune out the background for a second and, and turn off the media and just think about what's important. What was important before? How has it changed? What do you want to do about it? Your social life, excuse me. <clears throat> um, your, your social life, are there people that you've been thinking about but haven't connected with? Are there people who you've connected with but things haven't gone as well as you want? Are you, are you thinking about your work life where, <coughs> excuse me, where you know, we, are, we seem to be productive working in boxes, but we've lost some of the imagination in work and we've lost some of the ability to connect and bounce off each other to be able to start new projects. COVID has a had has a, has had a way of turning issues that were that were subclinical into symptoms problems and even crises you know and along those same lines what we're seeing um, are increased rates of depression anxiety PTSD uh, suicidality, especially in adolescents and teens, um, a lot of secondhand trauma from first line uh, responders and healthcare workers and caregivers. Um, and from a medication perspective, interestingly, and probably not surprisingly, we're seeing increases in prescription rates for all of these things, 18% more antidepressants since COVID, anti-anxiety medicines have gone up. 34% um, and 14% more insomnia medicines. So we, we know that in a very short period of time, a lot of these things are, are, are worsening. But on the other side of it, um, that also indicates that more people are seeking treatment, uh, which is a good thing. You know, the, the other aspect that I'm seeing a lot when I work with children and families and some adults is that now that everybody is home, uh, COVID has actually just sort of uh, weirdly brought families together, kind of forced people more to spend time with each other, um, which has made some relationships uh, more difficult, but a lot of the time it's actually helped in relationships and family dynamics, um, just with more time together. Um, and parents, for uh, better or for worse, are much more involved with um, their child's education and learning and have kind of become uh, second teachers, which I'm sure for a lot of parents is a lot. Um, you know, and since the start of COVID, we've also seen a huge explosion in telehealth health care for, you know, out of necessity. Um, but you know, now that, that all these things are put in place and people are learning how to 
do healthcare uh, remotely, um, especially with mental health treatment, it's allowing more and more people to get access to care, which is actually a pretty good thing. So the title of the talk was Coronaphobia. And in, in this country, it seems to be uh, becoming a catch-all term for the behavioral and health issues uh, stemming from the epidemic. But in, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the UK, uh, there's some research that I found that was pretty interesting that are looking at a specific set of symptoms which turn into uh, an attempt to identify a syndrome called coronaphobia. Uh, and the physical symptoms of dizziness, sleep disturbance, immobility, difficulty in, in, in organizing yourself for any kind of action. And of course, there's always stomach distress. Those physical symptoms seem to be highly correlated with these psychological symptoms. Obsessive fears, constant worry that something, something might be going wrong or someone you know might be sick. Uh, avoiding anything that might, uh, that might involve any kind of uh, risk and I don't want you to look at my pantry because hoarding may be a real thing. And of course, those symptoms lead naturally to the wave of anxiety and depression. Uh, I had my physical with my family doc this week and he said, you can't, you can't understand how much anxiety and depression I'm seeing. And I said to him, Dave, I do this most of my life. <laughs> Anyhow, so anxiety and depression is just become part of the epidemic of the pandemic. Um, that feelings of vulnerability, feelings of impending doom uh, that, uh, and in fact, the, the third wave is that's affecting the country now seems to re result in, in negative view that of the world and negative view about the future that we're going to be in lockdown forever, which is not true, but it, it is with us for a while to come, I'm afraid. <clears throat> and along with anxiety and depression, um, we're also seeing a lot of increased substance use. Um, I know one of my one of my friends works at a liquor store and said he's never been so busy. Um, you know, people are home and there's not as much to do. Um, you know, and actually we found some numbers for you. Um, alcohol consumption has gone up by 14%. Um, and a lot of recreational drug use has also gone up, um, which along with that, really importantly, 18% more suspected drug overdoses since the start of COVID. Um, so I think there are multiple things that we need to be paying attention to um, and trying to get our, our loved ones and, and friends to seek treatment. Um, it was just, I thought she was gonna ring it down. There has also been, um, a lot of my patients have told me that, you know, some of the virtual AA meetings and group therapies, and it just doesn't really uh, work for them. It doesn't feel the same. You know, so there's kind of a, a little curve there of, getting used to how things uh, are right now. I wanted to just make a special mention about loneliness. There is a, there's an epidemic of loneliness in our country. And in fact, the last time I, I had a chance to speak with you all, we talked about there is a minister of loneliness in the United Kingdom because of the pandemic of loneliness. That was there before the virus and the virus has only made things worse. In a survey performed by Cigna of about 20,000 participants, mm -hmm. almost half have reported sometimes or always feeling alone and almost half reported having few meaningful relationships. You know, and it's, interesting because um, I know that I see people five years old and up and um, my dad, Dr. Sheslow, sees uh, kind of the same kids and adults. And um, apart from reading the statistics, I think we're also seeing this um, in practice as well. And it's really, I find it really interesting because the 
Um, people that are the most lonely are the 18 to 22 year olds. Um, many of them have just finished college or are in college or finished high school and are trying to figure out what to do now. Um, but it's interesting because they're at the lowest risk of, of getting COVID and dying from COVID um, and getting sick, yet they're a lot, of the a lot of the time having the most problem. Um, conversely, you know, we're actually seeing that the people that are over 72 years old that are at the highest risk for this are the least lonely, uh, the more most equipped to handle this. Um, it's, it doesn't seem to be as affecting them as much as uh, younger folks, which we thought was a pretty important thing to note and kind of interesting. I wanted to spend some time. I, in doing research, I found some of these, some of these uh, um, effects of COVID, which has permeated all aspects of our life, are not terribly frequently talked about, and I wanted to share some of that with you. Uh, cracked teeth, for uh, if you've been to the dentist and you ask, they will tell you that they are seeing so many individuals with cracked teeth. In fact, my when I was telling my sister about this, she told me she just got back from the dentist with a, fixing a cracked tooth. Headaches from tem temporal mandibular joint dystrophy from TMJ, very common. Teeth grinding is very common. Uh, when studies that looked at dreams from uh, Pre-COVID to the, our COVID times have found more sadness and anxiety in the content of dreams of women and considerably more anger in, uh, in dreams with men. And women seem to be dreaming more than ever before and not in the best possible way. Uh, it seems to be somewhat scary. Uh, LGBTQ youth seem to be having a particularly difficult time. The Trevor Project, some of you might know about them, did a, did a survey with 1,200 LGBTQ youth and found about three quarters of those individuals reported feeling increased loneliness, uh, with over 50% reporting symptoms of depression. The, the, the data that, that I found uh, most distressing was that 33% of youngsters uh, reported not being able to feel like themselves at home. And a lot of that has to do with parental acceptance. And the, the, last, the last thing I'll share with you is 71% of LGBTQ youth reported a deep distrust of police. That's really distressing. <laughs> Here's something that's really interesting. It's the opposite of what I would have thought. A uh, study by the Brookings Institu Institution uh, reported about uh, a half a million fewer babies are expected to be born, a 13% drop in a survey of looking at, at potential parents. Uh, and maybe that makes sense when, when you look at one LA hospital in, in uh, uh, reported that eight out of 193 babies that were born in this inner city hospital were COVID positive. Parents, potential parents, seem to read that and think, yeah, maybe I'll put it off. It certainly makes the impact of us old folks uh, will be greater because there'll be few young folks uh, coming to replace us. Paul, is that you or me? Um, that's you. That's me? Oh, and uh, looking at a, a parenting study. Uh, as, a, as a parent. As a parent. Yeah. I know this to be true because I'm still parenting. 40% uh, <laughs> of the respondents uh, showed increased frustrations with their partner. And uh, because they're living together, you know, for better or worse, and for lunch, and issues of childcare, issues of home chores. Guess who's doing more of the chores at home? Yes, that's exactly right. You all got it. And the, the difficulty in communicating uh, because two people are often working at home if you're lucky enough to be working. Uh, and uh, 
so that uh, being able to talk about those things has not been going that well because I have to rush off to the office here, which is in the next room. And again, not unexpected, four times more women than men have dropped out of the labor force. Uh, over 850,000 people have dropped out of the labor force, and most of those are, are women. And why? Increased need for child care, the increased cost of child care, um, virtual pressures to keep kids uh, being productive so that Google is not doing their homework. And of course, we would be remiss if we didn't emphasize that Black, black and Latinx job and income loss has become... Uh, part of, of the, uh, the increased level of stress in this country. Uh, and if, if political stress is not a real thing, you don't have a television. And if diversity issues are not a real thing, you don't have a TV. And if the virus isn't getting you, those other issues are contributing. This is the last bummer that I wanted to talk about because it's difficult, but I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, about this. Intimate partner violence has gone up significantly. There's been a five-fold increase of severe, inter part, inter, severe intimate partner violence injuries and a four-fold increase in very severe. Very severe has to do with organ damage and worse. And there's a phone number for the National Domestic Abuse Hotline because calling is critical. Women in particular, some about 10% are men, but women in particular, if they call, if they call the police, if they if they take um, if they take care of of uh, the acute part of of intimate partner violence, you have a better chance of surviving and 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 making it through. And yet, in a study from Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a wonderful hospital in the Boston area, women have had fewer hospital visits for inter part, inter, uh, uh, partner, for intimate partner violence than before the virus, because there's no way there's no way to get any privacy, and there's nowhere to go. It's very difficult to figure out where you're going to go if you wanted to leave. So it's it's been a very I, it's been a very difficult uh, situation and often alcohol is involved, of course, with, with all of this, which, which makes it uh, even more difficult, of course. You know, and so I think a question that um, we both get all the time is what, what do you do? You know, what, what can make this better? Um, and, you know, there's like a, a number of simple things that you can do um, you know, encourage friends to stay in touch, uh, you know, take out the phone and call somebody. You know, I think a lot of people are so used to seeing each other that we're a little bit out of practice with calling and not just texting. Um, you know, uh, promote integration between family members too, you know, especially with uh, the holidays coming up and, you know, a lot of people I'm talking to uh, are are pretty sad that they can't get together with their families for Thanksgiving um, or for Christmas, you know, or, or they're getting in together in small groups instead of the whole family. Um, so I think finding ways to connect, you know, and with Zoom and with uh, other platforms, it's, it's, it's easier than ever, which is really nice. Um, you just got to actually do it. Um, something else that I think obviously really helps is, is actually seeking help, which we're gonna talk more about. And, you know, with telehealth, obviously some people have a little bit of a hard time with it and, you know, getting, getting used to it. Um, but it's also really uh, in some ways easier. You know, I had a, a patient say, you know, I feel like I, feel like I have an on-demand mental health provider. You know, I just open up my phone or my computer and you're there. So it's kind of great. Um, you know, and Medicare will pay for it. Uh, a number of the private insurers are waiving co-pays, you know, so without a trip to the, the office, it's a little bit easier for some people um, to actually seek, seek care. 
Um, something else I have been uh, really hammering home with people is to get out and take walks, which as we're headed into the winter is a little bit harder, but you know, on a day like today, it's a you know, nice temperature to take a walk, um, get some vitamin D and some sun and you know, just appreciate what's around you. Um, along with that appreciation, you know, uh, comes mindfulness practices, which we're obviously can't get into the whole thing now, but you know, the overarching theme of mindfulness is to just stay present, stay in the moment, um, you know, try and view the world like a little kid does, you know, like the, I always tell people, think of the first time, you know, your, your kid or you as a kid saw the snow and think about how cool that was and awesome. And, you know, be present in that moment, you know, it's raining, think about the rain. Um, you know, we can, we can talk more about that if people have questions as well about mindfulness. Uh, I actually put a couple of references at the end for places to connect uh, for mindfulness practice. Um, and there are a ton of awesome YouTube videos with guided meditations and mindfulness practices. I, I can certainly point you in the right direction. Um, you know, and the last thing would be music. You know, I think now that people are home more, you know, listen to some more music. You know, it can be so helpful bringing people together. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of bands are doing virtual streams of their shows and concerts. And, you know, that's been a pretty cool thing to be able to still uh, at least a little bit go to a concert. I know a lot of, a lot of people are really missing live music. Um, so, you know, go, go to the show from your couch. And, you know, I, I think that goes along with just appreciating, um, appreciating things. So one of the, one of the, before we move on to the next one, uh, one of the, the symptoms of coronaphobia is immobility. And one of the things that, that you need to fight is, is the difficulty in initiating. Initiating something for yourself, initiating something for others, uh, is has become increasingly difficult. We have we have become somewhat immobile and and maybe even fearful about about uh, about reaching out to other people. Uh, but if if you're feeling any of the things that we've been talking about, if you're feeling somewhat lonely or if you're feeling disconnected. Uh, the first thing you have to do is be mindful of the difficulty that you're having doing something, doing something to initiate, doing something to take care of yourself. Uh, I, if I had one wish, it would be to, to find something that you think you should do and turn it into something that you will do. You know, I, I think people feel like they're out of practice you know, like I, I haven't done this in a while. And it used to be something you didn't have to think about. Um, you know, but I think along those same lines, uh, almost everybody, almost everybody feels like that, you know. And so, you know, I've, I've heard from uh, people I see that, you know, the first time I saw some friends, even if it was outside and we all sat across from each other, it was a little weird at first. Yeah. You know, we're a little uh, out of practice talking in, in real life. Um, you know, but once you get once that you get over that, it's it's not that all that different. Um, the one the one last thing that we thought was uh, pretty interesting was that there is an unprecedented number of cat and dog adoptions right now. I've actually had someone tell me it was hard to find a dog. That they wanted to adopt but you know and and do the dogs and cats and getting a pet at this time can be such a great thing um obviously as long as it's okay with people's parents um, so we just thought that was pretty cool so the question of when to consult with a provider there's no clear answer to that when issues become symptoms and symptoms become distress, 
it's probably time it's probably time to find someone to work with that that will provide you with opportunities for a new way of looking at things. Uh, the the first time I think of something, I think, oh, that's an interesting thought. And the second time I think, oh, I've thought that before. And the third time I think, oh, case after case after case. But when you actually have the opportunity to, to work with, with somebody who's not inside your head, you have an opportunity to look at things in a new way. And I think that, I think, that's a way of identifying possibilities and identifying the possibilities for change. There's one definition of psychotherapy that goes like this. Psychotherapy is a conversation between two people as to what one person really wants. And that's really not something you can do with a friend. A friend is not, is not someone that will talk to you about what you really want without having to talk to them about what they really want also. And in, in therapy, I've asked this question, well, what do you really want? And then if you ask the next question, down deep, what do you want? And then if you ask the next question, in your heart of hearts, what do you want? Each of those questions results in a different meaning and a different answer and a different understanding. And hopefully when you're working with somebody that you trust in psychotherapy, you can get to the place of what's in your heart of hearts and be able to make the changes that make your life, that make your life better. We, you know, we, we're, we're cheated by this pandemic. It's stealing time from us. And for those of us who are older, uh, we don't really have the time to go along with the theft. So we have to get the time back. We have to find a way to be able to make our lives more like the lives that we want to be able to lead. And how many psychologists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Oh, I know the answer to that. <laughs> What's the answer? One. Just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Um, you know, but I think for people that, that want to change or want to seek help, um, you know, obviously we would encourage you to do so. Um, and we have left a lot of resources at the end of this presentation to hopefully help people kind of navigate through that. I think the hardest thing for some people is trying to figure out where to go, where to start, um, when to seek care. Um, and a lot of people that have never ever done anything like this or had to do anything like this don't know what to expect you know it's, it is a little different than going to see your rheumatologist or your general general care general uh, practitioner um you know i i think from my perspective what i you know primarily do is is the medication management piece as as gloria alluded to um earlier and i i think you know, I want to hammer home the point that just because you meet with somebody for medicine doesn't mean you need to take medicine. It just opens up a conversation about what might be helpful. A lot of the times, you know, if someone's in therapy, um, it's totally okay to ask your therapist what they think about medicine and if that would be helpful. And if they do, you know, maybe they have some notions for you that you can kind of bring and talk about. Um, you know, Generally, when someone comes to me that's never been to any mental health provider before, I do my best to make sure that, you know, it's just a conversation about what's going on. I often will ask people, how can I help you the best? You know, um, someone much smarter than me once said, you know, if I was a magic genie and I I came to you in the middle of the night and I said, I can change one thing before the morning to make you better, make you feel better. What would that be? So I think, you know, I challenge or invite everybody to kind of ask themselves that. And, you know, that's the thing to bring to, to therapy. That's the thing to bring to the medication provider to see if we can pinpoint the help the best that we can. Um, but I also always encourage people to, to remember that that with therapy and with medicine, it's an ongoing conversation between, between us, between the mental health professionals and the patients. Um, and so by that, you can 
kind of work together to find out what is going to help the best. Um, so I and there are, there are so many preconceived notions. Uh, you know, even before my son was a nurse practitioner, I grew up with psychiatry. Uh, and uh, on either side of my office, I had, I had psychiatry. And so I, I wasn't one of those psychologists that, were, that, that was ever anti-medication, although many, many providers tend to be that way. I, I think life is hard enough, and particularly during these times, when you're looking at the increase in anxiety and depression, I think another way of talking about that is you're seeing an increase in suffering. And I, I believe, because time is valuable, that you want to find a way to decrease suffering as much as you can. And, and if you take medicine, and if you go to therapy, you don't have to sign up for a lifetime. Although that's good for our practices, it's really not essential. The, the, the goal of, of any provider in mental health is to actually put themselves out of business. And so, I don't think I don't think Paul would say this, but uh, you, you know there are side effects that sometimes occur with medicines, but there are also side effects that occur by not taking medicines. You know, you may feel anxious, or you may feel depressed, and that might be the main the main symptom. But the side effects are difficulty in family relations, difficulty with uh, losing um, the, the the, uh, the, the work interest, the productivity, those are side effects. Those aren't the main effects. The main effect is you're feeling down and, and anxious. So it's, it's worth thinking about that for psychotherapy too. People can be sometimes reluctant to find a counselor or a social worker or a psychologist because they're, they're anxious about opening up something that that that's novel that they've never done before. Um, but the people who you're working with, most of them have done this before. And the goal is to provide a, you know, a warm and trusting relationship atmosphere where you can be in control with how much information you want to share and how much information you don't. So I, I would certainly encourage, particularly during this time, uh, thinking about the, the, the benefit that, that an outside uh, provider could be to you or the family. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with whole families uh, in, the, in a large box or in small boxes uh, together. And, you know, I was, I'm pretty skeptical because I'm more, much more of an interpersonal kind of guy. But uh, I've found that you can provide some some uh, pretty reasonably, pretty reasonably intimate care over over the internet, and um, if if you're if you're if you if you're feeling anxious and depressed, if it feels like you know life has really become burdensome, give it a try. You can always say no thanks after the end of a couple of sessions. I think that's I think that's a great point, um, and I think that telehealth offers unique opportunities. I've gotten to meet people's cats and dogs. Um, you know, I've gotten to see people's artwork that always wanted to show me a painting that they made. And now, you know, I had, had a patient the other day who said, you know, I wish I could just show you this, this painting I just did. Um, since I've been feeling better, I started painting again. And I said, well, was it at your house? And she said, yeah. And I said, are you at your house? And she said, yeah. I said, why don't you show it to me? You know, and she was able to do that, which was really pretty amazing. Um, and it was actually a really good painting too. So, you know, I, I think it does, um, as clinicians and patients offer an interesting window into, into the, the lives of the patient and to an extent the provider. Um, you can see I have a guitar on my wall and you know, people all the time will uh, kind of bring that up. Like, oh, you play guitar, that's, that's pretty cool. And, it opens a conversation that maybe wouldn't have happened with a patient. So um, hard to get I used to. I had a similar experience, Paul. I had a, uh, I'm, I was working with a mom and her son and the son was reluctant to get out of bed. 
And so I asked mom if she would like to carry me into his bedroom and we all got in bed together. Not, not literally, but we did, we did therapy for that session in his bedroom. And you know, he, he never would have shown up for therapy if we, didn't, if we didn't come to him. And so that was kind of fun. And it turns out that uh, you know, he had a good time. So I, I was thinking we leave the last, um, we have some resources, like I said, um, at the end of the presentation that I'm, I'm hoping, the, I think the presentation will be available to people. I was hoping to uh, take the last 15 minutes if there are questions. Um, Gloria, are there any questions? There, there are. Okay. You do hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the questions that I have is from an anonymous attendee. And she says, these statistics seem hopeless. Is there any help? Mm. Any hope? I'm sorry. You know, we wrestled, Paul and I wrestled with this very issue as, as we were presenting some of this data and wondered if we were going to be the best bummer at uh, the Jewish Federation. And we thought by at least presenting this, it increases the awareness that something can be done, that something probably should be done. Uh, you know, th there's, there's, uh, there's so much that was going on before that, that was able to be swept up, but the virus has just increased the level of anxiety and tension. And that doesn't mean that we have to give up. In fact, it probably means that we have to do things to be able to work a little bit harder to make it work. Uh, my, my wife uh, says, if you're not doing something to make it better, you're just being lazy. And why would you wanna be lazy in the service of, of, of your, your own health and mental health? You, you probably want to be able to and if you can't do it yourself because you're feeling down, connect with somebody who can help you do the thing. Connect with somebody in the family that, that's willing to be that support for you. Connect with a friend and, and share with them what you're feeling so that, that you, can move to, you can move to the next place to make it better. Uh, I, I think knowing is always the first step of change because I think the, maybe the Rolling Stones said it. You can't get what you want until you know what you want. And so you got to know before you can get. Mm. You know, I think that's a good. Well, I'm I was sorry. Just, uh, real, real quick, I was just going to say that I think that's a good question and something that uh, I'm seeing all the time in practice. Um, you know, I said uh, to a patient one time recently, what, what else can I do for you? And she said, well, if you could get rid of the coronavirus, that would be awesome. You know, and I said, obviously, I, you know, unfortunately, I can't, but I would like to. Um, so while I think those statistics are um, certainly daunting, I think they're also pointing to the fact that people are seeking more care. Um, and there are... Uh, professionals that are available to help people navigate through this, um, through medicine and through therapy, you know, and so I think that the goal I hope people take away from this talk is that not that the statistics are, are so bad, but that there actually are help available for these things. Um, and, you know, we're here to help you navigate through it. I, th I think there's one last question that um, Christy Moretti is asking, when you see someone on overload slash the brink of a breakdown because of all of the stressors of COVID-19 is placing on them and you try to express concern, all they constantly say is, I'm fine, don't worry about me. Any tips to help them? Are they coming for help? I mean, are they coming? For therapy, let's look at this in two different ways. The, the, if, if, if you can't get them, let, let's say it's an adolescent and you can't get them to come into therapy, have them come with you because as a parent, you need help. 
there are sometimes adolescents are willing to come and help their parents who clearly need help uh, and that they're willing to come with them or be seen as the family. People who might be reluctant to be the patient might not be reluctant if the family is the patient and, and the family is being seen together with a shared commitment to, to change. Uh, the, the extreme of that is something that might be thought about as an intervention where people who, who are involved with the person, who are loving and, and considerate of this person come in a way that, that is at least mildly confrontational, that, that talks about the need for some kind of change to happen. And typically the people who say I'm fine and everybody knows they're not fine, those people are depressed and, and we need to reach out further. We need to try a little bit harder to connect with them. Uh, I, have, I have people in my family who, uh, who are I'm fine and uh, we have very gentle discussions because they certainly don't want me to be the family psychologist. Sometimes I'll pass them off to Paul, but they certainly don't want me to be the family psychologist. It's easy to be frustrated and to walk away from these people because you're, you see them suffer and you still can't seem to help them get to the next place. Don't walk away. You have to stick with it because the first time you hear something, you may not necessarily want to do anything. The third time, the fourth time, maybe that's the time that'll actually work. You know, I think, uh, especially from a, a medication perspective, um, and I said it before, but just to really make sure that the point comes across that just because you see somebody for medicine doesn't mean you have to take the medicine. You know, or if you take a medicine and you don't like it, that there's no reason to stay on it. There's so many different things to choose from. Um, you know, which often I, I make sure I kind of hammer home uh, because I think a lot of people, that's, that's the biggest thing. And, you know, I tell people, you know, the first time I meet you, I'm just going to get some information. I'm going to tell you how I think I can help you the best. And then I'm going to ask you how you feel about that and how, what you think is the best way to help yourself. And hopefully those two things line up. And if they don't, then we'll have to find a way to, you know, come together and work together. You know, I work together with patients. I don't work, um, on my own, you know? And so I think that that's one tip to say like to that person, you know, it seems like you could use a little extra help. You know, maybe let's just meet, meet with him. And if you don't like it, I, you know, if you don't like him, don't ever see him again. If you don't want to take the medicine, it's okay. But now at least we know what a professional thinks might help you. Um, so I think that's important. And you know, Gloria, uh, these days you can be invited into somebody's living room and so that the, the person could be participating, but not participating at the same time. And so you're there. I often make deals, particularly with, with, uh, with kids who, who really don't want to, who don't want to participate. Uh, two sessions, two hours. You know, don't you think two hours, you can afford two hours to help your mom or dad out? I mean, it's only two hours. That's not even a video game session for you, but so sometimes if you make a deal for two hours and if I can't seduce you into, uh, into sticking with me for, uh, you know, because life can be better, then I, I guess that's it for now. But um, well, I don't like to give up so easily. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I will continue because these days during the time of our pandemic, life has gotten harder. And I think it's, it, 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 one could give up, but then you have two problems. You have life that's hard in the pandemic and you've given up. So you have to, you have to be able to find some way of borrowing the energy, even if you don't have it, some way of, of connecting with people to help you to get to the next place, even if you can't seem to get there for you, by yourself. You know, I think, I think that's a good point about telehealth too. You know, I, I saw a kid the other day, um, a little kid who the, for the first appointment, um, we met under his couch and we found a, a Hot Wheels toy or car or whatever that he was looking for. So that was pretty sweet. And 
The next appointment, we, we met on the couch, but hiding under a blanket. And the third appointment, he was sitting at the kitchen table and his, his mom wasn't even there initially. I just wanted to say hi. So um, it kind of offers that kind of unique opportunity too, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty exceptional. Any other questions? Well, there is, there is I think, um, one last question from Christine Reddy. She said, I thought you'd play music for us, Paul, with your <laughs> guitars from the wall behind you. Mm. I, wanna, I wanna thank um, <laughs> the Cheslos for really a super, super presentation. And there are uh, questions, there are some more questions that we'll be able to answer uh, offline. Um, I also would like to... Um, Paul, if you flip the last slide, I just wanted to show folks that there are, these are general resources that can be really helpful. The National Alliance of Mental Health, flip the next one, but messages for parents, school staff, online support for a variety of mental health and substance abuse issues, mindfulness resources, and us. So those resources will be posted on uh, the, on wherever they're posted. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you right now. Okay. <laughs> Um, your, again, your presentation was terrific. Um, and thank you, participants. Please come back and join us for our other wellness sessions. And feel free to contact us with feedback or to get further information or answers to the questions we could not get to today. On our landing page, you'll get the answers to the questions. And the landing page is siegeljcc.org backslash wellness. Coming up next, we have guided meditation with Kathleen Perkins from the JCC at 6 p.m. And I'm gonna say, make pretend you hear a drum roll. You don't want to miss the Resilience in 2020 panel discussion moderated by JFS CEO Basha Silverman at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you for your attendance. <laughs>